Welcome to the Parker Web Partner Show, where we find creative solutions for creative agencies. Welcome to the Parker Web Partner Show. I'm Daryl Parker, founder and owner of Parker Web, uh, found online at parkerweb.com. And with me today is... I am Meryl Loeschner, founder of Smith Douglas Associates, a creative agency down in New York. And what we'd like to focus on are creative solutions for creative agencies. And so we run into problems, we see problems in our work that we do for our clients, and we want to provide you with some solutions, some answers, some things that we find when we're out delivering services on our for our company and what we're seeing out in the marketplace as well. This week, we are talking about communications and how important they are between client and you, the agency, or between client and their end user, their customer. And we wanna look at how we manage and how we prepare for those expectations and communications. Uh, one of the things that we like to start out with is we like to look at our ticket system because we handle hundreds of tickets a month uh, that come into our company. We work with uh, small businesses and, and agencies all over the country. And we get a general feel for what's coming in on a regular basis. And we're calling this segment our developer's desk. And with us today is Caleb Parsons, one of our developers at Parker Web. Caleb, what are you seeing uh, coming in on the ticket system? Thank you, Daryl. Uh, so yeah, what we've been seeing in the ticket system recently is uh, Everyone is talking about Google Analytics. Uh, Universal Analytics is being sunset on July 1st of this year. If you've forgotten or, or haven't uh, gotten that migration process started, it's important to uh, be ready uh, because uh, Universal Analytics will stop processing data on July 1st. The good news for many folks is that uh, Google Analytics 4 properties are being created automatically for you if you had a previous Universal Analytics property by Google. Your, your website will keep tracking data if you haven't acted yet, but it is important to uh, be checking analytics and you know making sure that things uh, have uh, moved over correctly and migrated to this new property. So tell me about the experience. So, okay, I have Google Analytics. Uh, I used to have it, or now this transition is happening. What happens when I log in after July 1st? Yeah, when you, when you log in now, uh, you'll often be prompted with a message saying, you have X amount of hours, X amount of days before Universal Analytics is retired officially. There's a wonderful kind of click by click process that can help you get started. It is it is important though that you're you know checking your site, checking what tags you have on your site. Once you start using the Google Analytics 4 tag, you won't need the Universal Analytics tag, for example. So that can get removed. It's always it's always good to uh, be checking your, you know, the header of your site, for example, and make sure you don't have lots of lots of unused code there because it will only slow things down. So, what are some of the clients experiencing that they're trying to do the upgrade themselves? You know, when they're in there and, and then they have to call us. Like, why is it that they're calling us? What are they running into? A lot of it is, you know, just sort of making sure that the new property that was automatically created. Um, that that is still processing data the same way that it was before. With this being an event-based property, um, some of the uh, ways that Universal Analytics was tracking data, what clients are used to seeing when they log into Analytics, it's changed a little bit. So there are some different uh, places for, for different parts of um, the, the data coming in, like events. Um, and conversions. It's a, a lot of it really just has to do with uh, confusion with this new with this new format. So when these creative folks are installing Google Analytics, do we have any like tips that we've run into? Like what are some tips of the trade that we can share with them on doing these installations? If you're looking to get the most out of Google Analytics, our recommendation is that uh, you don't just install Google Analytics 4 and the 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 tracking tag uh, through there, 
but that you um, start by installing Google Tag Manager, um, which will allow you to connect your site to Google Analytics and then also uh, create things like a custom event for when someone clicks on a certain button on your site and you're really looking to know, you know how many people uh, have been clicking that button. Um, Google Tag Manager makes uh, tracking uh, that sort of data a lot easier. So the process is you've got a client that's it's running the old universal analytics before and now they want to upgrade because Google's screaming at them to do this upgrade, right? Every time they log in, but you're, we're recommending that you install Tag Manager first and then install Google Analytics 4. And that's the kind of the process that you would go through. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. It's also, Google Tag Manager is also almost a necessity if uh, you are an e-commerce site, if uh, your site is um, a Miva site, for example. Google Tag Manager is critical to the implementation of uh, tracking things for e-commerce. All right, Caleb, thanks a lot. We appreciate all that good information. You know, the other thing that I want to get into in this episode, and I'll try to do every episode, is to talk to you, the owner. I'm, I'm the owner of Parker Webb. I'm and the I'm, owner of Smith Douglas. Yeah. yeah, we each own our own businesses, and we are in this uh, sector right here along beside of you as the owner of your own creative agency um, or digital marketing agency or uh, technology company. You know, it's it's owner to owner. I mean, the three of us are, are here right now. Um, uh, me and Meryl and you. <laughs> so, um, but I, I kind of want to share, you know, I've been doing this for about 27 years and I just want to share some of the experiences that I've had in this, in this kind of segment that we're going to do every week called the corner office. So um, the big thing I want to jump into this week is the uh, in the line of communication is just share with you a little bit about my story about why we answer the phone. Um, Meryl, what's your favorite thing to do when you uh, call a company? Oh, it, I uh, just love staying on hold and type one, type three, type five. I, I, I sometimes I get on those calls and I try to break the phone tree just to see what I can do to to bypass it as quickly as possible. How well, many times can you hit zero and hope to get a real person? <laughs> exactly. So one of the things I decided really early on, I, I, when I first opened my business and had a, I actually had a storefront. On a, on a main street. It was on West John Street in Matthews, North Carolina. And uh, we had a neon sign in the front window that said, we put websites to work. Uh, this was in the early 2000s. And we had people to just walk down off the street. And someone who just walks in off the street into your office, you can't just ignore them. You have to say hello. And you have to speak to them and you, and you engage with them. And did we get a lot of business that way? No. You know, honestly, most of the people who walked in were looking for directions on how to get down to the uh, uh, the Sam's Club or something. They weren't necessarily looking for us. <laughs> but the point was, was that um, we, uh, we opened our arms and opened our hospitality and we wanted to provide a higher level of customer service than what we felt like our competition was doing. So when we did decide to go virtual in 2012, we up until that point had had a receptionist on the desk and that person was responsible for making sure that when the phone rang, it got answered. Um, and we always had this live person answer policy. And then when we went remote, we were trying to figure out, well, how do we do it? Like, it's so hard. Do we have someone call? Because then, you know, even it was about 11 years ago that we went fully remote. And even then the technology wasn't super advanced on how to handle that. So we used a call center um, initially, so that when you called in, you did get a live person. But what did we run into really quickly? We ran into the fact they didn't know what they were talking about. And when a live person calls, they're investing in you too, right? They're in saying, hey, I'm willing to call. I've gone through the effort to pick up the phone and try to get a hold of somebody. And I, at that instance, I'd almost rather get a hold of the machine if I'm, not, if I'm only going to get a hold of someone who can't help me. Yeah, you don't want to tell you the whole story. I'm having a problem with this. How do I do this? How do I do this? And you get a, 
hold on one moment, please. Let me forward you to someone who can help. I'm like, I have to tell that whole thing again. Right, exactly. And it's just like, can you, I'm just trying to take all these notes, right? And I can't get it all into the email. And so it definitely felt like an answering service. And we started getting feedback almost immediately that, that we had lost some connection with our client because they were used, even existing clients were used to just being able to call in and getting access to whomever might be doing the work. Um, and so then we started testing different systems and saying, well, how can we get it so that when they call in, um, it will go to a certain phone number uh, and then that person can answer the phone. So we did that. That was our immediate solution to the um, call-in service that we were using. And we used that, I, I probably used that almost a year before I canceled it because we were just in a transition and we were trying to figure out what to do. And I didn't really have the staffing at that time to make an adjustment. Um, and also so the problem is if the, oh, you program it in, this person calls, oh, let's switch it to that person's phone. Right. They're out, they're on vacation, they're at lunch. Exactly. Yeah. It's still and not a live person answering the call. Right. And it, it's, and you get voicemails more than you don't get, you know, and it's like that we're not achieving our goal. We're not achieving the goal of, of answering the phone with a live person. Um, and we just felt like that was so important that we had to continue to invest and try to figure this out. Um, so we did route it to the person. We ran into those problems. And then ultimately what we were able to sort out was, um, um, a phone system that allowed us to ring through the computer and through our uh, mobile devices, uh, all of us um, at the same time. So it's Grasshopper. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, coming up. But um, the idea was, was that when it rings to the company, it rings everybody. And so we had to be sure that we were hiring for people that could be on the phone. And that's, that's different, right? Oh, absolutely. And it's, it also puts the ball in your employee's court because every single person in your company is responsible for customer service. It's not the, oh, well, that's the customer service department. That's not our thing. Every human being in your firm is responsible for customer service. This is also every single in your firm is responsible for your brand. They are answering the phone. They may be first point of contact for your brand, what your company is about. So yes. that definitely needs full employee buy-in, which can be hard. Well, especially in the tech world, right? When you have mostly, I have a, a company full of developers who aren't really known for their personability. Um, and so um, we did establish that as a requirement for the work that we do. And, and we want to work with, because of the type work that we do, we felt like it was very important that when someone called in for support, that they were able to get that from someone who was customer service oriented. So I often like to say we're a customer service company first, and we are um, just happen to work in the web space, right? So uh, we very much want to focus on that customer service. So then once we had the system, then we set some KPIs in place some key performance indicators. So one of those KPIs that we set in place is that we wanted to call calls answered during business hours as close to 100% of the time as possible. Um, and so our system, Grasshopper, allowed us to be able to track what calls went to voicemail, what calls didn't get answered, and um, what ring the call was answered on. So how long did it ring? So we also set another KPI that the phone needed to be answered by the third ring. Um, so just setting those two KPIs in place um, shaped a culture in our organization of we answer the phone and we answer the phone expecting to deliver customer service and our clients love it. And now, were you able that. to measure who was answering how fast? Because, you know, you're always going to get somebody going, I'm going to get every call and you're going to get somebody yeah. going, somebody else will get that. I'm busy. So, the, you know, obviously our developer team is a billing team, right? So we did have a layer in place for um, reception, right? So our um, business administration would catch the calls first. But if that person was out of the room or on another call, everyone else understood that if it got to the third ring, somebody better pick up. Um, and so that's just a way that we kind of balanced it out. Because, you know, 
developers are, you know, time is money. We, we want to be sure that we're billing and that we're not interrupting work and, and whatnot. Um, but there's always this expectation that, yes, we're, we're going to have to handle that call when it comes in. So, you know, does this work on scale? You know, if we had 100 developers, probably not. Um, but we will have, even if I have 100 developers, they'll all have access to a telephone and they'll all be working and or they will all have the customer service capacity to be able to work with a customer in live time, in real time, one-on-one. -on -one. And that's just a fundamental philosophy with how we work. And I, I get a little frustrated when I go to technology companies or I go to creative agency companies and their phone number is nowhere on the website. Um, there's an email form and I'm like, okay, well, how many hoops am I going to have to jump through to talk to a person here? Oh, absolutely. There's whole websites who are like, you really need to get to Microsoft. This is the super secret phone number that you need to call. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's the, oh, well, well, we'll give you customer service if you pay extra for it. No, if you have, if you're selling me a product, if you want me to buy that product, I want to be able to speak to a human being. Yes, I can look at your chat bots. Yes, I can deal with your FAQs and your fill out the forms. If there's a problem I need to fix in a timely manner, don't make it hard. Right. And, and I honestly think that the ability to answer the phone and be present for your customer when they walk through your front door, so to speak, mm -hmm. is, a, is a competitive advantage. You know, a lot of bigger companies like your Microsofts and what they can't, they just yep. can't. They're at a yep. scale where they can't do it. And a lot of times customers are buying from local agencies and local companies like mine um, because they get a person to talk to. So you need to work toward those advantages and those differentiators in the market. Yeah, no, absolutely. And even if you're a bigger agency and you can't have everyone answer the phone, the people in accounting are not going to answer the phones, the, whatever, you still need to have that responsibility for everyone in this company is responsible for branding. Everyone in this company is responsible for customer service. There is no such thing as that's not my job. Right. If you work for this agency, you are a walking, talking billboard for this agency. Yes. And you definitely, whether it's you have the creatives, whatnot, they need to be able to answer the phone and need to be able to ha handle calls. Yeah, it's if I'm a creative and someone's having a billing problem, I'm like, oh, you poor thing. That must be so frustrating. I know just the person you should speak to. I'm going to walk right over and make sure he gets your call. I'm going to feel thrilled as opposed to got the wrong person. Yeah, let me not my problem. I'm going to send it over to somewhere, especially if someone's upset. They just want to be heard. They want to know someone is listening. Someone is empathetic. Even if they can't directly help, they're going to go out of the way to find you the help. And that is such a powerful thing. Well, and that's taking responsibility for the customer. You yes. know, and that's, you know, we're going to be talking with Patrick in just a minute about responsibility and, and how creatives have a responsibility to provide and, you know, in this scenario, in this case, customer service. So take that information and I hope that it's useful to you and uh, I'll share some more. If you have any other questions or comments, please sure to be sure to post them and uh, I will try to answer questions when, when we get those. All right, so today's round table, we're gonna be speaking with Patrick McLean um, from Reinforcements. Uh, you can find him online at sendreinforcements.com. And Patrick, I was reading one of your articles uh, just this past week about how you believe, and I'd like you to fill us in on this, about how creativity is not just about freedom or is it about freedom at all, and it's more about responsibility. Okay, well, I think there, there are two things that come to mind when, when I wrote the article and I was thinking about responsibility and creativity. One is... If, if you expect someone to give you their attention and their time, as fragmented as things are now, you have a responsibility to reward it. So if I, for example, if I write a lead magnet, I have a responsibility to make that thing valuable and make it match up to what they thought they were going to get. If you write a movie, you have a responsibility to entertain the audience um, in a specific way. Um, if you, if you, 
don't take those responsibilities seriously, the end product is not very good. And, uh, you know, just bad, bad things happen business wise, bad things happen personally. I think if you, you phone something in, um, the second way that responsibility matters is if, if you're given a problem to solve, uh, you really have to be responsible in solving the problem. And I think that one of the things that I've gotten tripped up with over the years and have finally gotten clear about is that nobody, the way I put it in the post is nobody wants a, a shovel. What they want is a hole. Mm -hmm. And in many parts of the world, like when I was just a copywriter, I could get frustrated that, you know, I was providing this script or I was providing this, this copy for a website or, or even if I can date myself a brochure. Um, and, and so that feels like it's my final output. That's not a final output for anybody. The final output for those things is maybe sales or conversions or creating a feeling in an audience. And that's the thing that I think as a creative, once you start to take responsibility for those things, then the work uh, goes up, better things happen. Um, and if you listen to any uh, interviews, but anybody really makes a good film and takes a lot of craft, everybody on the film will tell you that they have a responsibility to tell the story, the lighting guy, the actor. We're just all here to, we have a responsibility to the story. And that's, so that's kind of my. How do you think you get clarity around, like when you're working with a client, how do you get clarity around that responsibility, you know, where you don't get in your own way from a creative standpoint? Um, well, I mean, I think you have to, you have to define an outcome. Mm. what somebody wants on the other side. And I was thinking in, in preparation for this, you know, the, if, if people would probably do web design for free, if all they had to put in there was lorem ipsum delor sit amen, right? <laughs> because it's cool and it's fun and you get to use these tools, you get to make a beautiful website and, and, you know, it's great. And then you really get, get proficiency at this set of tools and you can make things quickly. And uh, the problem is what's the thing supposed to say? How's it supposed to work? And getting that information out of a client is just, I mean, it's like the eternal problem, right? Well, it's like, kind of like, why are they doing a website anyway? Right, Meryl, you were going to. I'm just saying it's a, that was going to be one of my questions. It's the, you know, you have that responsibility, you know, that the end result, especially if you're working for a client is sales or branding. How do you, get that with a client who's just saying, oh, we, no, no, we just need some words. And you're trying to get them like, why, why are you in business? Who are you trying to reach? And they're like, oh no, just write something up. Well, I mean, I have a, I have a process for that. Like I've been doing that for a long time and I can have conversations, but I, what I would say about creative responsibility is that even if somebody's like, yeah, I don't care what you put on the website, I still have a responsibility to think it through mostly what I make now is videos and I have a responsibility to think through what would make this a good video, both not wasting uh, the viewer's time, rewarding them for watching it, being entertaining or quirky or that kind of, uh, you know, a useful. A and then what is it going to do for the business? So I, I have a couple of, I I've had a couple of clients, a client that I worked with over the years and they, they, they're a sales organization. And I don't know if they if they even have a CRM now, right? And they, they didn't really measure anything. And they just kind of wanted these these videos that were really funny um, that I guess about 10 or 15 years ago, it was, it was high leverage for them just to send a video rather than to be like, hey, uh, you know, did you see the game last night? It was, a, I called it sales candy, way to open these things. Yep. They didn't measure anything. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I asked, and I'm like, I want to put together a case study. How well do these things work for you? And initially they worked great. They they had some measurements, but they didn't track it through sales and whatever. But I, I still feel like it makes the work better if you have that, uh, you take responsibility for that. Especially well, as a creative, you it's not your job to guess. It's it's the you you want to see the results of what you do. I always jokingly called it throwing a rock in the well and wanting to hear the splash. Yeah. Well, that's a great analogy because, you know, every, that, that's so good because every time you, especially a deep thing, you know, you throw it in there, you're like, how deep is it going to be? Yeah. It's a great. analogy. <laughs> um, you know, the Washington post came out with an article, uh, I think it was earlier this week about a writer who had been completely replaced by chat GPT. So he was writing mostly small blurbs about products and doing small blog posts and doing social media posts. 
and nine of his 10 clients had decided that they were going to use chat GPT instead of him. Now, obviously there was some misunderstanding as to the value that the writer was providing uh, in this scenario. So how would you advise this guy in this, in this type of scenario or where could he have taken more responsibility to getting the why to the customer? Okay. Um, well, there's a, there's a couple of things to unpack in there. One yeah. is it may in fact be, and I don't think this is the case. I, I think maybe they'll be back for reasons I'll, I'll get to. It may be the fact that the guy wasn't a very good writer and chat GPT was better or good enough for the things that were being written. And there is that you have to be better than um, chat GPT, which I don't, I don't think, or Bard or, you know, whatever, which I don't think is as much of a challenge um, uh, as, as some people think it. it's not the end of the world. They, they tested GPT for um, a number of standardized tests, the ACT, the LSAT, the S, uh, SAT, a bunch of um, AP exams. And it got fives on a lot of AP exams. The ones it didn't pass, it got twos on, uh, were the uh, the literature and composition and the language and composition uh, tests. And I took both of those and I got a five and I placed out of having to uh, do, do those basic English level classes in college. And um, you really have to think deeply about uh, and be human to write it, the essays for those. You know, you have to think deeply about literature. So I, I think that uh, for personality list things, but the reason that I think that those clients are probably going to be back uh, at some point is that maybe a lot of people think that they can just have this vanilla, you know, GPT spam. It, it, this is just a wave of it coming, which for me means that people have to be more original in their communications. Like uh, somebody joked that there was going to be a Turing test for whether or not you were dealing with chat GPT, which is if you could get it to say something truly awful. <laughs> you know, right. it's got all this, is this a real thing? Can you, can you say this? Would you, would you just swear a lot for me or whatever? But, but we're going to be looking for those, that weirdness. And like the article that I wrote about, uh, wrote about creative responsibility and creative freedom. I don't think I could prompt um, an AI to write that. I don't, What's I don't think the client's misunderstanding about outcome that makes GPT appealing versus someone who has the capacity to do that compositional and conceptual writing. Well, for one thing, it's always the value of the writer, which has always been a thing because it's the, why do I have a high, higher professional? I can write stuff right. and writing yeah, the, stuff, the, the writing old, good stuff. I have a keyboard. Exactly. <laughs> and writing, and I'm actually looking at this chat GTP and seeing the, the wave, as you said, of vanilla mediocrity. That's going to make us writers more valuable. Exactly. You, have, you have seen the garbage out there. I'm working on videos for one of my clients. He said, oh, we could just use one of those AI voices. And I gave him a whole bunch of AI voices. And he's like, do you know any humans who can do this? So just this morning, we hired a professional VO actor because you just couldn't get the warmth of humanity. He's a lawyer. He didn't want to sound fake. He is, his brand is authenticity. The mm -hmm. last thing you want to do if your brand is authenticity is to sound fake. Yeah, yes. the I, I go to some pains to shoot videos with the actual people who work at the companies. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of coaching involved, but it, the way I say it is nobody else can be authentic for you, right? So it's always right. kind of better and you always want the, the, the humanity and the imperfections. But I think it's an evolutionary thing, right? Uh, what, what, what you're saying about the... Um, is right now, it may be the case that ChatGPT is good enough, but when everybody uses ChatGPT and 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 a lot of these AI tools to generate a lot of pretty crappy content, there's just a tsunami of awful con content coming, which I think you're right. I think it makes people who um, can make better content uh, more valuable. This is yeah. going to be a transition period, though. Oh, yeah. Play with the new toys, right? They're just out there seeing what they can do. And well, mm -hmm. it, it makes me more powerful, right? It, it makes me explain that. To... How do you say? How do you mean? Well, I can, um, I can As sort of write the text and have it. Yeah, I can have it summarize it. I can take inputs and I can say, "Can you clean this up? Can you? Can you?" Um, you know, it's it's like having it's like having a junior writer, or you can 
uh, for me, what, what the fastest thing is, because the stuff I'm, I'm not dealing in volumes and volumes of text, um, like writing a novel. Uh, but what it's really useful for is I have to get up to speed on something quickly. You, you know what right. I mean? It, and it's really good to ask questions for. It's fantastic. I, I think people underestimate the value of having having AI as a tutor in any subject um, because well, it's endlessly patient. And it's you're hitting right on Mark Andreessen's point. Uh, also, a post that he put out this week about how chat, how AI could save us. And it's because it, when we move it into that augmentary role instead of the leading role, it human makes us loop. more human, more, and it makes us more productive and more able to fulfill. Um, so while we may, in the short term, view it as a threat, just like this guy in the Washington Post did. Um, in the long term, it might make us better. And the, yeah, of course, and more productive. And as as the tools that allow me as a creator to make an end product are just going to be better, and I'm going to have more more power and control over those things. But you know, the 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 analogy that I use is what a writer really does. I think is they figure out they model another person or other people in their heads. When you write fiction, you model characters and you see what happens. When you write marketing, you're trying to empathize and understand someone else's position and give them what they need. Um, I think that's the, the best way to look at it. I know some people are manipulative and I think that's a fool's errand. But um, but uh, AI doesn't have the input for that. And right. I use an analogy for fiction, which is um, you can train uh, AI on all of mythology um, you can train it on languages. You can train it on, you know, all, all, literature before 1900, all of it, right? World literature. But what you can't do is you can't send it to war. You can't have it lose its three best friends in a week. You can't have it see the way the world was destroyed. So you don't get the writers of the lost generation. And in particular, you don't get J.R.R. Tolkien inventing an entirely new genre of fantasy. Mm hmm because mm -hmm. what he was doing was he was dealing with the, the, the very deep feelings and the agonies and the suffering. And he was processing that into a work of art, which we all respond to. That you, there's no data set for that input of, I feel nervous about losing my hair. Mm -hmm. how, wh how should I write this thing about, you know, uh, uh, you know hair regrowth products or whatever? Like it, mm -hmm. there's no data set for that. So yeah. in, to bring it kind of full circle, AI has the ultimate freedom. Right, but does it have the responsibility can it, to for for this final output that's needed with the emotion and the responsibility to the customer, the responsibility to the client and the client's customer? So it's a tool, but it's a tool that has to be used in such a way responsibly. Yeah, I think you could say that. I think the other way to talk about freedom in the creative process is that I need to. Generally, I spend a lot of time talking to my clients and encouraging them that they have more freedom than they realize. Because right now there's sort of a very narrow window of everybody sort of does the same thing and says the same thing. And it's become uh, more and more corporate, um, especially in publicly held companies, right? It's the same damn anthem spot that everybody sees that's saying the same, like it's, the, the problem is, is that no one will pay attention to it. They'll ignore it because it's just like everything else. And I think that, that, that AI is a tipping point for that. So you have to, you have to throw elbows is, and even in the initial meetings, like one of the things I'll say is when they kill an idea, because they say we could never do that. And I'm going to be like, look, uh, it, it might get killed, but we're not the people who are going to kill it. And for the next 15 minutes, let's just pretend we're totally free. And then it opens things up. And there was a great creative director who said the way to do the best work is um, uh, you come up with an idea and everybody laughs and says, that's great, but we could never do it. And then you figure out a way to do it. That's awesome. And I think that's a great differentiator, right? When creatives are talking to their clients, that's how, we, that's how we're different than, than the tools that are out there. And that's how we bring the human layer to the work that we do. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us here today. What a great conversation about responsibility and communicating with clients and understanding a lot of the tools that are showing up in the marketplace. One of the ways we like to wrap up is, is we like to jump into uh, some tools, you know, that, that we like to use. And one of the tools, going back to what I was talking about earlier in the show, 
uh, that I want to talk about it in communications is Grasshopper. Uh, so it's a great voice over IP phone system. Uh, we use it internally at Parker Web, and it allows us to ring all the desks for our developers to fulfill on our promise to have a live person answer the phone. So I encourage everyone to check out grasshopper.com. Um, it, it can work on your mobile phone. It can work on your desktops. Um, Caleb, what do you think? What's a good tool for you? <clears throat> um, well, to connect uh, to something that I was talking about, or possibly I will be talking about, <laughs> <laughs> To 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 connect to a uh, a previous conversation, um, I use a uh, I'm often checking Google uh, I'm often checking client sites for Google Analytics um, with Google Analytics uh, the Universal Analytics sunsetting on July first. Um, there's lots of lots of people looking to. Um, either migrate over to GA4 or they're looking to, uh, you know, just kind of make sure that everything is set up uh, already. And there's a wonderful uh, extension for Google Chrome called uh, Tag Assistant Legacy. Um, and using that I and re refreshing the page, I can quickly check to see what kinds of tags are installed on a website. Um, it's not it's not perfect. Sometimes you have to do kind of a deeper look into how the tags are installed, but it's a great way to check to see, you know, has someone uh, kept up to date or do we need to do some some additional work? Yeah, quick way to get an overview. That's awesome. Meryl, what do you have for a, a tool that you want to leave us with today? Sure. Uh, I've been a published author since I was nine. I love writing. I'm also dyslexic, so the spelling thing was always a bit of a challenge. God bless Grammarly, because not only does it make sure I'm spelling it right and using the right word, some of the autofills it also has makes me realize that sometimes I use the same phrase over and over again. And so it'll autofill a phrase it expects me to type, and that's, that's like, oh, yeah, I use that phrase a lot. Let me reword this another way. So it's a way to slow down my writing a bit and make me really think about what I'm trying to say as opposed to just hurry up and get the thoughts on the page. So I use Grammarly on everything. Perfect, perfect. Patrick, bring us home. Uh, this is tough. I'm on this, but I haven't, I haven't thought about this. So it's a tool you use for, to enhance communication. Enhance communicate, or what's a tool that you use normally in your practice as a as a writer or a videographer that um, you'd like to share with other agencies? You know and the problem I, that it solves. You know, um, I use uh, Keynote a lot, okay. but I use it to prototype things, and I, I think I think a lot of people do this, but I, I cannot. It is the quickest and dirtiest tool I can use to comp something up or badly, you know. Put it together. Um, actually, you know what? I have a better tool. I have a better tool. I use it all the okay. time. I use sure. uh, I use Dropbox Paper um, oh. as my as my project management thing. So, so what's the difference between that and just the regular Dropbox? Well, Dropbox Paper is a page, and you can throw any links or anything on there, and it provides a chat interface. And it's just a re it's it it's deceptively simple. But any link or file you throw in there, it'll deal with it. It'll keep track of communications with a whole bunch of people and has some simple timeline stuff. And it's just enough of a tool for me that uh, it solves the, uh, the the nightmare of my my working life is that I have to click over to an email and then I have to look at a text message or a chat over here or something over here. It would be something in Slack. Where is, you know, is it, a, is it a Google doc? Is it on Dropbox? Is it, I just want everything in one place. So I don't have to context switch because that just drains all your energy. That's pr I got to check that out. It's yeah. Especially when you're doing like the research on doing writing, right? I mean, it's just a place to kind of put everything, it sounds like, mm -hmm. as you're doing and, all that. And keep, keep everybody coordinated. Um, for note apps, I would say, uh, and I've used all of them. I use Bear on my phone because I have, um, uh, I'm in that Mac ecosystem and it works great. And I also use uh, Ulysses to keep longer texts and longer things together. So it's a really, it's a really nice writing app. Um, Very cool. That kind of stuff. 
Um, well, we'll, we will put links to all of these apps. We are not paid endorsements at all. We don't get paid for any of this. But if Grammarly wants to pay us or Grasshopper or any of those folks, we'll take their money. But uh, we just like to talk about the tools that uh, that work well for us. So, well, thanks for joining us today, Patrick. How can folks reach you if they want to talk to you? Uh, there's there's uh, contact information at sendreinforcements.com. And then that article is posted. I have a newsletter that I talk about all this kind of stuff, which is uh, reinforcements at substack.com. Um, yeah, that, that, those would be the easiest ways. We'll put the links in the in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you for listening to today's episode where we spoke a lot about both communication and responsibility. Caleb talked about how we want to be sure that we are bringing knowledgeable solutions to our customers and considering all the factors when we're giving information to them. So it's not just an upgrade to Google Analytics 4. There's a piece that needs to be in there. I touched on how incorporating customer service philosophies into your business can be super important in not only framing customer expectations and joy and delight from your customer, but also in framing and helping your your employees understand where their roles are with the customer. And then we jumped right into a great conversation with Patrick McLean from sendreinforcements.com, where we got into the responsibility of a, being a creative in this space today. So thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we look forward to talking to you again. If you have any questions or would like to see us cover a particular topic about your creative agency, send an email to Daryl at daryl.parkerweb.com. And I'll answer your email. Perfect. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to the Parker Web Partner Show. If you need help in this ever-changing digital world, reach out to us at 877-321-2251 or visit our website at parkerweb.com.